Hey, welcome back. I got a really cool video for you today. My German Shepherd a few years ago chewed off the corner of our bed when she was a puppy, and we can forgive her for that, no big deal. But that did leave us with a wrecked corner bed, and on both sides, I might add. So today, we're gonna take the simple foam, we're gonna carve it to the pieces that we want, take it out into the shop, do some lost foam casting, and I'm gonna take you through every step of the way. Stay tuned. This project all starts with some high density foam. In this case, it's black, but in most cases, it's either blue or pink where I live. I was careful not to get bogged down with trying to use hot wires to cut the foam. Although it is a cool process, it's not really necessary. For this one, I just used a router to round the corners and to cut the recess you're seeing here. But the router got away on me while I was cutting it, and it cut a bit of the end off where I didn't want it. So we gotta trim these up a little bit. I'm pretty sure my wife won't know. Now that I'm perfecting the skill, I'm spending a bit more time on the foam product rather than the end casting. It's amazing how close the castings will be to the foam if you coat them properly and spend the time. While I was marking this, I was really surprised how the pencil was cutting into the foam. This gave me an idea. Rather than carving it with a knife, I could probably just draw on top of the surface and that would give me the detail that I was looking for. But we'll get this all cleaned up first and then we'll get to that here in a second. I paid special attention because the foam disappeared quite fast with the sandpaper so I had to be careful. I had kind of an idea of what I was going to make and I'm kind of making it up as I go here. However, I did find on a test piece that the direction that you drag the pencil is important to give you a better imprint of what you're looking for. And the pencil was almost rounded to an eighth inch ball at the end of it. Okay, I really have to apologize. I missed part of the project where I was gonna glue it together and show you. However, I'm gonna show you the dipping process and I, at least I got that far. Now, I showed you the carving process a couple minutes ago, like that. Now we're gonna go over and we're gonna dip it. And then we're gonna hang it in the shop with all the other stuff and hopefully this works out. One of the problems when you're dipping is you'll have air bubbles in it where it won't get into all the pockets that you need. One thing that's really helpful is spraying it with a soapy water. This will break the surface tension and allow the plaster to get in deeper. I did try putting soap in the actual plaster, but it didn't really make too much of a difference in the end game. Now, it's just a matter of pouring the drywall plaster that's been thinned down over top of the product and letting it dry for a good amount of time. Generally with the more detailed parts, I'll pour over it twice or maybe three times, getting every nook and cranny. Air bubbles will be hidden below the surface, so you may want to take a brush and brush off the top surface to see anything you missed, and then recoat. The drying process is definitely where you don't want to cut any corners. These molds dried in my basement for about two days, standing on end, but they weren't dry when I packed them in the sand, and I'll show you more about that later. Let's store this away for next time. Let's fast forward two days. I've already gone ahead and put the other one in, but let's watch how I do this one here. I finally found a good quality sand that gives me a really good surface finish if I don't cover it with plaster. This would be a good time to suggest to avoid silicosis you might want to wear a mask because all that dust is going to kill your lungs if you start breathing that in. And on that note, it's probably a good time to tell you that pouring hot molten metal over top of foam has a lot of safety issues that you might want to watch out for. Now, the next step is pretty simple. You give it a bang in the side of the pail to get all the bulk of it down. And then let the recip saw, without a blade in it of course, touch the side of the pail and it'll vibrate it all down. The key here I found was to get the sand well vibrated all the way around so that it packed hard. If you don't, it will collapse on itself and you're gonna get a botched casting. The two main keys that I've been finding with this is your temperature and packing your sand. Originally I was trying to put binders into the sand because I thought it would help, but in this casting it didn't make any difference because I didn't put any binders in and it worked out quite well. Now what you're seeing on the top here, as you might know, is the dross. Now the dross is basically oxidized aluminum. This oxidized aluminum is useless for the casting and it needs to be scooped away. If that dross gets in there while it's being poured, it'll stop the flow of the metal and wreck the casting. 
This is the second or third time I've used this thermocoupler and it's worked out quite well. Getting the temperature correct for this is important. Although this isn't absolutely necessary, this tool, it sure does help. Check out one of my other videos where I talk about this more in depth. 750 Celsius is the number that I'm looking for here. Lost foam casting generally for aluminum will pour 50 Celsius more than what it normally pours at for say sand casting or anything else. Now here comes the myriad of safety violations like icy ground and molten metal and well plastic pails. I'm pretty sure this will be the last time I use plastic pails because I'm also running out of plastic pails as well and hopefully I can get a line on getting some metal pails. I would not recommend using plastic pails whatsoever. Now here's something really important to note. Look at the aluminum that's bubbling out of that can. This was only a little bit of moisture that caused this to happen. I mean a minute amount of moisture. Any more moisture, this would have spit out directly up in the air into my face. And this is why it's important to have all the safety gear. And paying very special attention to not having any moisture whatsoever in the sand, the plaster, or the foam. Let's have a look at the casting. Now I'm really putting my life on the line here. Even with all the safety violations of the icy surfaces with molten metal and plastic pails, I snuck the parts into the kitchen while the wife was out just so I could clean them because I couldn't clean them outside because it was winter time. I mean, what's a guy gonna do? Now let's do a breakdown of the part. The outside surface looks really good. Luckily, this is just a cosmetic part. As we flip it around, there's a few problems that could be pointed out. The first part that I'm going to point out here was due to a little bit of moisture. However, this valley that I'm pointing out now was due to the two metal surfaces coming from different directions and coming together at the same time. Because the two oxidized layers that are coming together won't bond together properly. Sometimes you can have a perfectly good casting and those laminate layers are folded together inside and that'll be the source of a crack later on when you need it the most. Now this part here this was simply just the casting being too thin in the foam. Hey, if you like this video, hit subscribe. My next project's gonna be making a seven inch hand wheel for my service grinder, machining it and installing it.